All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. morning. It's good to see you all here this morning. Uh, If you're joining us for the first time, my name's Jeff. I'm the lead pastor here. Really glad that you guys are joining us today. If you are a first-time guest today and you haven't yet received a first-time guest gift, we want to hook you up with one. Uh, Just as a little way of saying thank you for joining us and something that will hopefully remind you of us in the weeks and months to come. Uh, If you didn't already receive that gift, you can text the word new to the number up there on the screen. There will be a little form to fill out in response. And then what you can do at the end of service is visit Connect Central, show them that you filled out that form. They'll hook you up with a little gift just for being here today. Thank you guys for joining us. Also, if you haven't already done so, you can follow us on social media. Uh, You can find us on Instagram as well as Facebook. And we are currently live on Facebook. And so if you're on there, feel free to take out your phone, hit the share button, uh, let your friends and family see what's going on here and let them hear the gospel message today. It's a great opportunity for us to share it that way. Um, Really glad that you guys are here this morning. Last night, uh, if you weren't able to make it, there was a worship night that uh, a movement church worship team helped lead, and they did absolutely incredible. They they did us proud, and uh, and what's so cool about it is they said, we're not sick of singing and playing yet. We're ready to do it in the morning after an all-day thing. And, uh, and so we're really blessed uh, to have the worship team that we have. Um, and more importantly, we're really blessed to have the God that is the object of that worship. Amen. Uh, last night at worship night, Pastor Ronnie from over at SBC was talking about how what worship is, is it's essentially saying to God, you're worth it. And how we, we reflect that in not only the way we sing, but also the way that we live. But it starts with this. If we can't do it in the way we sing, we certainly can't do it in the way we live. And so let's recognize today that God has given everything in order to redeem us. He is absolutely worth it, and let's sing to him like he's worth it. Amen? All right, stand up. Let's sing together. This is my 
testimony from death to life because Greece rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony oh I'm alive this is my testimony from death to life because Greece rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous
promises you've kept and every need you've met. Lord, I'm so grateful you were with me every step and I never will forget when I think of how you've blessed me, how your hand has never let me go.
Last night, uh, between Ronnie's message last night and this song this morning, you know, one of the things I'm reminded of is the fact that, like a lot of times when we see people that are very clearly in love with Jesus, that are clearly doing everything they can to follow him and to serve him, and they're passionately worshiping him, a lot of times we look at the person and we admire the person for their love of God. We admire them for their love of God, but here's the thing. What we often fail to realize is the reason that they have that love in the first place is because God's love for us is greater. That the reason that love is there is because there is a God who sees all of our failures and loves us anyway. Loves us literally to death. You maybe have had a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife tell you, I love you to death. But the only one who's ever proved it so far is Jesus. We have a lot of reason to be grateful this morning. Let's go to God with grateful hearts and let's pray. Father God, we come to you right now and we just thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for the love that you've shown to us. God, the reality is, is there's no human love for you that could ever match the love you have for us. There's nothing we could give back to you that you needed from us. And yet we needed you desperately. God, we just thank you so much that you think of us. It's just amazing that the one that created the heavens and the earth would, would hear our voices right now. Would consider what we have to say. Is concerned about the smallest pains and struggles and difficulties in our lives. Is concerned with our satisfaction even though he is forever satisfied in himself. God, we're just humbled by this reality this morning, and I pray that we would just bask in your love, that we wouldn't take it for granted. This song that we just sang is all about gratitude, but God, help us to live grateful lives, not just sing a song of thanks, but to live grateful lives where we're just completely sold out for you, completely bought into what you're selling because you're worth it. I pray that this morning that you would just bless the teaching of the word. I pray that people would receive it, that their hearts would be open to the truth of your word, that I would get out of the way, and Lord, that you would just speak. I pray that kingdom business would be done this morning. This wouldn't be just an event that we attended. It wouldn't just be something that we sat through or endured. But God, that you would meet with us here that you would move among us here, that we would sense your presence here, knowing that you're here with us. We love you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, say hi to a couple people around you. Introduce yourself if you've never met them before. Fist bumps are acceptable. High fives. All the things. Good morning. This one. <laughs> All righty then. A little Jim Carrey coming out this morning. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, so let's start with a couple of announcements real quick, and then we have a, a special, uh, I guess, presentation for you in a sense. I want to introduce you to some people because today uh, we're relaunching our Connect Groups, and I'll explain a little bit more about that here. Ow, ow, that's right. Um, we'll explain that a little bit more in just a minute. Uh, but first, let's get into just a couple of announcements. The first one is Sunday Serve Day 2024 is upon us. It's two weeks away. This is happening on Sunday, May 5th. And if you're newer to Movement Church and you don't know what that's all about, uh, 
here's what it's all about. Uh, it looks like us taking a Sunday morning when we would normally gather for singing and for teaching and for that sort of thing, and instead we're saying, hey, we're going to come together as a church, but we're going to pray a little bit, we're going to do maybe a short devotional, but then we're going to deploy the church. We're not going to be pew sitters on this particular Sunday. Rather, what's going to happen is we're going to go to different sites, both Uh, Some of them will stay here in the church. Uh, There's things that we can do here in order to serve people. But we're also going to be going out into the community to basically take care of needs for people in the community. And so that involves things like helping the elderly, serving veterans, blessing nursing homes. Uh, We've been uh, in touch with Coventry Local Schools. They've got some projects for us. Uh, And it basically involves going out and showing tangibly the love of Jesus through our service. Because I don't know if you knew this. But the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And what that means is that his people are called to be servants. And so on that particular Sunday, we're like, we're really going to emphasize that point. And so if you are interested, and you should be, because we will not have a normal service that day. So if you show up and you're like, I'm going to wear my Sunday best and I'm going to not get dirty, wrong. Just don't even come that day. But I want you to come that day. You know what I'm saying? So it's Sunday, May 5th. Make sure you register at Connect Central before you leave. And here's the reason why. Uh, While supplies last, we have T-shirts that we give out every year that say Sunday Serve Day, the updated date. Uh, And this year, it's going to be a beautiful shade of red. And so if that's your color, you really want to be there. Uh, And so make sure you register before you leave. We need to make sure we know who's coming. Uh, If you have any limitations on your serving ability, like if you need to be seated, we need to know that as well so that we can make sure we put you in an appropriate spot. But man, I'm telling you, it's a really good time, and it's a good opportunity for you to connect with other people in the church as well. Some of you are looking for connection. Uh, For a guy especially, it's a lot easier to connect when we're doing something shoulder to shoulder versus when you sit me down and put me face to face with somebody, right? It's easier to talk. So I encourage you to sign up for that. That's Sunday, May 5th. Uh, Next is baptisms. Uh, Baptism Sunday. We don't have a date scheduled for this yet, but what we like to do is we like to announce it, and then we'll put a date on the calendar when we're certain uh, that the people who are being baptized can be there. If you don't know what baptism is, baptism is something that all believers are called to do uh, essentially after they believe, right? And so baptism is something we put our faith in Jesus, and then we get baptized as an outward confession of that faith. Uh, There's a lot more significance to it, but if you believe in Jesus, but you haven't yet been baptized, that's your next step in the faith. Like, that's, that's not something that's, like, just for movement church. That's, like, biblically speaking, if you believe in Jesus and you haven't been baptized, that's your next step. And so, if that's you and you need to be baptized... Uh, What I encourage you to do is visit Connect Central uh, before you leave. Let them know that you're interested in baptism. You're not even committed to it yet. What will happen is a pastor will call you and will talk you through the significance of it. We'll make sure that you understand what it means and that you're ready for it. And then when you say, I'm ready to go, then we'll put it on the calendar and we'll invite your family and friends. And it's going to be a wild good time, all right? Crazy party time, right? Uh, So that's coming up. So if you need to be baptized, make sure you stop by Connect Central on your way out. And then uh, giving. If you have an offering to give today, uh, there's a couple ways you can give. Uh, If you're a paper or plastic money person, you can give back at the cafe. We have a card reader and we have a little box you can drop uh, your paper money into. Or if you're like me and you prefer to give digitally, you can download the Tithely app or you can just go to movementchurch.com slash give. We just have all those options because they're all available to us in today's day and age. You can use whichever one's easiest for you. Um, I wanted to share really quick uh, something that your giving has done this week because, you know, one of the things we repeatedly say here at Movement Church is that God blesses us to bless others, right? It's not, we're, we're just like, we're not like these, these buckets where we just try to get as full as possible and hoard all of our stuff. Like, that's not biblical. It's not what Jesus has called us to. It's not the example he set for us. And so as a church, we believe we're blessed to bless others. And I want to share with you how as a church, we've been blessed and we've been able to bless others this last week. So uh, I'll I'll share one about how we blessed somebody who's outside of the church and then one of how we shared or blessed somebody inside of the church. So there was somebody who um, I know sort of as an acquaintance, his sister used to come to this church Um, Unfortunately, she passed away a few years ago, and I believe this was the way I met him because I preached her funeral, 
And, um, and so as a result, we were in contact that way. Haven't heard from the guy in years, and he reached out to me this past week, and he said, hey, um, I, my company that I was working for shut down. I got another job, but then they laid me off, and I'm in like dire straits financially. I don't know what to do. And uh, initially, like just contacted, literally not knowing what to do, not even knowing how we could help. And so we, I talked with him for a little while, and after we talked for a bit, uh, one of the things that I had learned was that he was about two weeks away from his, his phone being shut off. By the way, this is in the midst of losing his home, like he was having to move back in with mom. And so it's really, really bad stuff. And he had interviews calling and other companies calling for work, but if your phone gets shut off, they don't have a way to reach you. And I said, I think we can do that. And sure enough, we were able to do that. And so because of your giving and God's generosity through you, we were able to make sure that he is able to get called by those companies and we were able to bless somebody and share the love of Jesus in a really practical way, which is awesome. Uh, here's another thing. So this week um, in my Connect group, uh, we were talking uh, just kind of about our weeks and we were praying for each other and that sort of thing. And during the course of my Connect group meeting, this is one of the important things about Connect groups is you find out what, where people are struggling. And we found out through the course of conversation that one person in our group, uh, they were struggling financially and uh, had just been hit with some big things all of a sudden. And we've, my family's been there recently. Like we've been hit hard at times and God's always provided. And at times throughout history, he's provided through other people. And there's been people who have blessed us to help us stay afloat. And we've had the opportunity to do that for others. Um, and then the, literally the same night that they were sharing with us about their financial difficulties, they were driving home from that connect group and their vehicle broke down. And they needed a, a $300 repair. And thankfully, because we've made provisions to do that and we've made margin to do that, we were able to immediately say, we can pay for you to have it fixed. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that so cool? And so again, it's, it's, not, that, it's not that we're, we're um, taking full responsibility for other people and we're carrying all the weight for them, but Galatians tells us that we're to bear one another's burdens. Bear one another. Like, like if, if, if I'm helping carry somebody who's got an injured leg and, and we're, we're to come under their shoulders and, and support them until they're able to walk again on their own. This is what we're called to. And listen, you guys did that. Like it's God blessing you, but, but through you, you guys did that. And so that's why I always want to encourage you to give the very best you can because we're constantly doing stuff like that and, uh, and it's a blessing to be a blessing to others. So thank you for doing that. I encourage you to continue to give uh, the very best that you can. With that said, now I want to uh, talk a little bit about our Connect Groups and our Connect Group relaunch. Um, I will, I want to briefly just kind of talk about Connect Groups, but if you're a, a Connect Group leader that has been informed that you're coming up here to share about your group today, you can just kind of come forward and filter over here behind me somewhere if you'd like, wherever you're coming from, all the corners of the, the winds here. Um, so Connect Groups are really special. I... Uh, I didn't fully understand their value when I was younger and when I was a younger believer. Um, I, without realizing it, you know, I, I always kind of pictured the sort of the big gathering of the church like we have here today. And I always kind of pictured that as being sort of the main thing. And it wasn't until years down the road that I realized that um, there is some of the, the greatest help, greatest teaching, greatest memories, and greatest relationships came from small groups of believers within the church, okay? Now, these small groups are not the church, but they are an important aspect of it because very few of you have relationships with the people that you're sitting around, but when you're sitting around a table or when you're doing an activity or you're learning something together, it almost naturally happens with very little effort. Just by being locked in the same room. We don't lock anybody in rooms, do we? No, right? We don't do that here. But if we did, just by being locked in the same room, you're forced to get to know people and to build relationships. You know what their struggles are. You know how to pray for them. And I'm telling you, it changes the dynamic of not only your church experience, but everybody else that's there as well. 
It's just different, all right? And so connect groups are a very, very special thing. Um, We have, up to this point, had connect groups that just sort of ran continuously and they just ran on forever and people would jump in and people would jump out whenever they could. But we're, we're, we're trying something different. And the reason is, is we want to make it accessible to you. We want from time to time the topics or the focus of the groups to change. We want it to be easier to recruit group leaders so, so that there's maybe a shorter term commitment to it. And so what we're doing for the first time in a very long time is we're actually doing sessions that have an end date to them. So we're doing an eight-week session of Connect Groups that starts today. Or today. Like, it starts today, this week, right? And so these group leaders are the ones uh, who have committed to leading groups during that eight-week session. And so what I'm going to ask you guys to do, I'm going to pass the mic down, and I'll just kind of finish up last. Um, I'm going to ask you to tell us your name. Tell us what your group is about, what your topic is, or who you're, who you're ministering to or with. And then I want you to tell us when you're going to be meeting and then any other, you know, interesting things that we might need to know about your group. Okay? Hey, you all know me. I'm Pastor Rick. We meet on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. We do an in-depth study of the Bible. We're doing the Pauline epistles now, so we'll be working through his letters for the next few months. My name is Mike, and you see me walking around with security, but I'm... Aside from what Jeff said, mine's not starting tomorrow. Mine's on a Monday, so I'm starting on the 29th. So it's not like, hey, let's come tomorrow night. But starting on April 29th, it's Christ-Centered Evangelism. It will be eight sessions that are revolving around the discussion of Christ-Centered Evangelism. It's apart from another evangelism class that follows a distinct method. This one's just going to cover topics like the introduction to evangelism, the heart of evangelism, the message of the gospel, understanding your audience, Methods of evangelism, overcoming challenges, the role of the Holy Spirit, and the commissioning. So those are the eight topics we'll discuss. They're independently formed so that you could, they're standalones. If you take one, then come two two weeks later, take that one. They'll all, you know, be good information, but they don't have to build on the last one. Hello, I'm nervous. (laughs) My name is Victoria Favinger. You, I wrote it down. I'm starting a Walk with Jesus Connect group where we go out and walk to fellowship with each other. We will be reading scripture either beforehand of and talk about what we read while I'm walking. I haven't figured out all the kinks yet. And I will be, it will be weather for guided. It will be weekly, so different days each week, around 6 o'clock time frame. So I hope you come and walk with Jesus with me. My name is Connor English. I have the privilege of, I think, running the longest running connect group in our church. Um, We call it the exchange. And um, yeah, so me and Jeff were talking and we talked about the idea that as a ministry of our church, despite it being a ministry of our church, it is also a connect group. Um, But it is one that focuses exclusively on grades 6 to 12. Um, And within that one larger connect group, we have a bunch of smaller connect groups and the leaders that meet weekly. And then we have our student leaders that meet weekly and small groups that will take place that you guys will find out about in the summer. Um, We cover every topic that they need to learn coming into the grander church so that they're ready when they get to you guys. Um, I also believe that I'm the one small group that has the privilege of saying, if you're not allowed to be in our small group because you're too old, you can still contribute to our small group in that we have camps coming up this summer that we have some financial need for, um, but we also have just many things throughout, as Jeff kind of talks about giving and how we aid in giving to our church. We do that weekly within the youth group as well, and so those types of needs as well can be helped and can be met by you guys as the larger church, and already in a lot of ways they are by your giving Um, because I'm also the only connect group with a budget line. And so, so yeah, yeah, if you know somebody in those age groups that might benefit from church that's more focused on their level, uh, send them my way. We meet Wednesdays from 6 to 8.30, but usually they start showing up around 5. And so anywhere in that window, yeah, we're good. We'll take them.
There's another group that is not represented on the stage today. Uh, there is a women's group uh, that has been meeting uh, every other week, I think, for a while now. And so even though they're not represented here, just know that that's another option for you. Yeah, for Rebecca and Sue, they're, they're leading the group. Neither one of them was able to be here today. Uh, that is another one where I guess others are excluded from, right? Uh, but, uh, and, and then lastly is my group. Um, I am planning on leading, I'm going to be doing something a little bit differently this year uh, or for this session. Rather than just going through scripture, we've been going sort of verse by verse through scripture for a long time. And sometimes it takes like a year to go through one book of the Bible. Uh, we're going to be kind of test piloting something where it's going to be sermon-based groups. And so basically every single time we get together, uh, we are going to do a deeper dive into the sermon from the previous Sunday. So there's all kinds of stuff that like when I'm preparing messages and stuff like that, that I leave out. There's like scraps that are sort of left on the cutting room floor of things where I just don't have time to go over everything. That particular group is going to kind of go over those things so we can take, take a deeper look. I can look you in the eye and I can say, how are you doing with that particular thing that we talked about? So it's going to get uncomfortable at times. It's going to be really fun. Uh, also, my group has historically, we, we do food. I like doing food at my groups, especially because we meet around 6.30. And so uh, we, I don't know if you, are you, any of you planning on doing food? You're walking, so you're like, no, we're not doing that. You, yeah, you guys do food as well. Um, but my group, we like to bring food and we just kind of invite everybody to contribute. So let me recap for you real quick and then I'll tell you sort of what, when is it? It's the first and third Wednesdays of the month. And I will tell you this, I want to discourage you, this, this is going to sound bad, all right, I got to be careful of this, I want to discourage you from coming to my group, and what I mean by that is, I want you to check out these groups, all right, that's what I'm saying. If you're a part of my group or you've been a part of my group before, like, everybody's welcome, I'm not going to kick people out unless we have too many people and we have to split or something, but, like, like I want you to check out these other groups. So, so here's, here's what's happening uh, moving forward. So in order to do this, what we're doing is after service, if you are interested in any groups, if you want to sign up for groups, the way that you're going to do it is you're going to take just a few minutes after service, you're going to meet us downstairs, and we're just going to have a conversation with you. And we can, we can sign you up, we'll take down your name, we'll take down your phone number, and then you can go on your merry way and go get yourself lunch. We're going to have some snacks available for you downstairs, uh, but we want to have a chance to meet you, give you a chance to ask questions, and, uh, and that way we have an opportunity to really make sure we start off on a strong suit. If you are already part of a connect group leading up to today, you must sign up for one. Don't think you're just grandfathered in. No, we're not going to kick you out. But, but nevertheless, don't assume. Like, come to uh, the relaunch event afterward. Make sure you just stop in. Again, it should only take a few minutes. You can ask your questions, sign up for your group, and then get on your merry way. Uh, feel free to join multiple groups if they're on multiple days. That's totally fine. Uh, I just want to recap really quick, though. So we've got a Bible study group, evangelism training, walking group, which that's awesome. Uh, we've got the exchange, so connect group for uh, students in grades 6 through 12 and volunteers who may be interested in it as well. We have a women's Bible study group, and then we have a sermon-based group. And so um, I hope that you'll consider joining us. I know some of you have expressed interest in connect groups, but don't just express interest. Nike, baby, just do it, okay? All right, give it up for these leaders. Thank you guys for serving our church. Appreciate you guys. That is awesome. And, uh, and if you're interested in becoming a group leader, you can talk to Pastor Rick uh, sometime, and maybe we can get you on the next, the next eight-week session or something like that. But uh, for now, let's get into this message. We are in a series right now called One Sentence Sermons. And if you haven't been around, let me just take a minute to kind of explain what this is all about really quick. Uh, one sentence sermons is this idea that we understand that all of scripture, all a thousand plus pages, depending on how big your Bible is, it's all God breathed. It's all inspired by God. But there are just some sentences that you come across that just hit different. 
They impact you different, they're more memorable, they're more punchy, and they cause you to take a step back and really just evaluate yourselves because they're so weighty. And so what we're doing in this series is we're taking a look at just a few of those one-sentence sermons, and we're taking a step back together and meditating on it and chewing on it and trying to get a better understanding of these short but powerful verses of Scripture. So, for example, in week one, uh, we talked about faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. And what we learned is that a genuine faith, a saving faith in Jesus Christ, always leads to good works in your life. And that if you say you have faith, but it's not producing good things in your life, then what you are is somebody who is deceived. Because your faith is not sincere. Faith without works is dead. In week two, last week, we talked about this challenging verse that forces us to kind of reconcile with people in our lives from Romans 12. It says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And so what we were faced with in that sermon was this idea that God has put the burden of responsibility on us to reconcile and to keep the peace with the people around us. That we can't look at others and say, it's all your fault. Because oftentimes we have a role to play in the conflict in our lives and our relationships. Amen? Yeah, we don't like to amen that one, but it's true. Today, since it's Connect Group Relaunch Sunday, I wanted to take a few minutes uh, to talk with you about community. And we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 24. This is our one-sentence sermon for the week. It says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, here's what's funny about this. This is one sentence. And so technically, this passes for this series, but it is a long sentence. It is a long sentence with a lot of qualifiers, but it's only one sentence, so it counts, all right? And so we're going to talk about this one today. Let me give you a little bit of context here. The book of Hebrews was written as both a warning and an encouragement, because what was happening is that in the early church, there were Jews who had become Christians who were being persecuted by their fellow Jews for becoming Christians, for believing in Jesus. They persecuted Jesus, and so it's only natural that they would persecute his followers. And so they were being persecuted. Their life was made harder, not easier, by following Jesus. And so what was happening is the the writer of Hebrews was writing this as a warning and an encouragement. He was saying, listen, I know you're tempted to go back to your Old Testament Jewish way of life, to go back to the old rituals, the old systems, the old laws, and to begin living as if you were just a Jew again. But, but I want to warn you and encourage you to follow Jesus because Jesus is superior to all of those old ways of doing things. The way that he describes it is he says that the the Old Testament systems are a shadow of what is to come. A shadow isn't the real thing, is it? No, he says Jesus is superior to all of it. And so if you abandon Jesus, he warns them, if you abandon Jesus, there's no sacrifice left to save you. You can't go back to Jewish traditions and say, I'm worshiping God, you're not. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That's true for Jews, and it's true for Gentiles. And so this letter is written, it sounds really harsh in places, but it's written during a very difficult time where these people need to be shaken, and they needed to be reminded of the value of Jesus Christ in their life. That to walk away from him is to walk away from the greatest treasure we can ever know. And he had to remind them of that. 
And so in this chapter specifically, he begins by explaining that Jesus is this superior sacrifice. He says, look at the Old Testament. He says, we sacrificed bulls and goats, but we had to do it year after year after year after year after year. Why? Because they were never enough. But when we look at Jesus, Jesus is the once and for all perfect sacrifice to God. That, that, that his death is sufficient to cleanse us of all of our sins, including the ones that you haven't committed yet. This is good news. And so what I love is the language of it. He says, by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And what I love about it is he, it, it, it sort of contrasts what is future with what is present. He says he has made perfect what is being made holy. In other words, this is crazy to think about. When God looks at you, those of you that have put your faith in Jesus, what he sees is that you are perfect in righteousness, And the reason he sees you as perfect in righteousness isn't because you're good, but because Jesus is so good that his sacrifice, when he he took your sin on himself, you took his perfect righteousness on you so that God looks at you now and says, this one's perfect. And yet, you're still being made holy. Made to look like Jesus. Made to walk and think like Jesus. Isn't that cool? It's something that is right now, but also kind of not yet. And there's a lot of these tensions in the Bible. And so, with all of that being said, all of these things that talk about how superior Jesus is, how he's made us holy, how he's the perfect sacrifice, then we're hit with a, a therefore, this is what we need to do. And there's three things that he gives in this section. The first one is he says, therefore, draw near to God. Like, if we have a perfect sacrifice, what that means is we don't have to be afraid of God's wrath anymore. We can run right to the throne room and say, Dad, I'm so glad to be back. Because we can draw near to God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. He says, draw near to God. That's the first thing we do. The second thing we do, he says, once you've drawn near, hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess, for he who promised is faithful. In other words, don't you dare let go of Jesus. Because he's faithful to take you to the finish line. He doesn't break his promises like other people have broken their promises. When I was a wrestler in high school, uh, one of the things that I was known for was annoying the crap out of my opponents with my grip strength. Like, I'm fairly confident that most of the people in this room, if I grabbed your wrists and you tried to get away, you just wouldn't be able to get away. Because that's how it was. Like, I would grab their wrists, and they would <clears throat> and kind of squirm. And I was just like, no, because if you don't have hands, you can't hurt me. You know, like, I would hold them to death. And, and, and literally, that tactic, that technique, just squeezing, clinging tightly to their arms, led me to victory over and over and over and over again. Same is true in the Christian life. Clinging to Jesus. Jesus, I'm not letting go because you're the one who has the promises. You're the one that has the power. I'm not letting go of you because you're my only hope. This is the attitude we're to take as believers. Draw near to God. Hold or cling to him. Cling to the hope that we profess. And then the third thing is the verse that we just read. Let us consider how to stir up one another toward love and good works. So it shifts from being about me and my relationship with God to all of a sudden the author of Hebrews is saying, you need to be concerned with the people around you and their spiritual walk as well. He breaks our independent, individualistic bubbles And says, no, there's more than just you that needs attention in this world. That I have not just placed you here to know me, but to help others get to me as well. 
to help others stay on the straight and narrow as well. God has given us to each other. That's what he's saying. And this is a shift in perspective for some of us. There's a lot of people in today's culture that treat church with the same consumer mindset that we treat everything else in life. Where's the best burger? Well, I'm going to go there. Eh, the quality's decline. I'm going to go to this place instead. And, and what we're doing is we're, we're looking for the place that gives us the most or gives us what we want. But the reality is the scripture says that the gathering of believers, the church, is something more than just how does it benefit me? That the reason that God has placed us together is so that we would look out for each other. In other words, rather than just thinking, how, what can I consume from this place? What can I consume from these people? We as believers, every single one of us, we're called to ask, how can I contribute something? How can I make their lives better? And just imagine if, if we as a church had a culture, and I think, I think we're well on our way, though I think we can always do better. Imagine if we as a church said, okay, I am going to pour into you, and you're going to pour into me. And what we establish then is this sort of cycle of just building each other up, 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 until we're something that we never dreamed we could have been on our own. Until we're someone that we never dreamed we could have been on our own. We are not to, uh, to think that we can get to Christ-likeness without the help and support of other believers around us. The reality is we all have moments and areas of weakness where other people are strong, and in that moment we need them. And there are areas and moments of strength in your life where God has called you to share your strength and lend your strength with others. Are you doing it? Are you doing it? That's what this passage in Hebrews is about. Let's, uh, we're going to break it down into three sections. And uh, we'll just start with the first part of that passage. It says this, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Many of you know I used to be a, a cage fighter. Um, I did mixed martial arts. I had five fights in the cage, and um, it's fun, man. It's just a fun sport. keeps you active, and uh, it's fun to punch things from time to time. I'm a pastor. I'm not allowed to hit people most of the time, but it's legal in there, so, uh, you know. Uh, but no, so, so one of the things that I learned from, from fighting that I don't think people realize the weight of is you don't, you don't know the value of having someone in your corner until there's someone in your corner. And what I mean by that is like when you're fighting, your corner man isn't just a fan who's cheering you on. There's a whole room of those people, but like the impact that they have is not the same as your corner man. There's somebody in your corner, first of all, who's looking out for your health. Their job is to make sure that you're okay, that you're protected in the ring. When you have a break in between rounds, they're checking for cuts, they're putting Vaseline on, they're making sure that you're breathing okay. Sometimes they tell you to sit and take a break. Other times, if your legs are wobbly, they'll say, don't sit down because you ain't getting back up. Shake it out. Like they're looking out for your, your body. They're, they're there to coach you. They say, hey, here's what your opponent's doing. You're not seeing it. Capitalize on this. Here's what you need to do instead. They're, they're teaching you how to be a better fighter as you're in the middle of a fight. And not only that, but they're motivating you. And it, depending on who you are and who your coach is, sometimes that looks like a soothing, calm voice. It's like, okay, we're doing really good. Nice job out there. They're trying to bring your, your heart rate down. And other times they're screaming in your face, like, do you want it or not? You know, like, like they're like screaming at you. They're reminding you of what's at stake, which I think that we as Christians need to be more aggressive about, reminding each other what's at stake. What I'm saying is I think that we as believers can do a better job of being in each other's corners. And here's what I mean. 
I think for the most part, we kind of treat each other like we're fans at one of those fights. In other words, we're in the audience, we're in the crowd, we want each other to do well, but we're not taking an active role in each other's success. I don't believe that's what the scriptures have called us to. I think the scriptures have called us to recognize, yes, we're all in our own fight to a certain extent, but man, does it change things when you have somebody in your corner. When you have somebody who's willing to help you out, who's willing to give you advice, who's willing to lend an ear, who's willing to challenge you and encourage you and hold you accountable, it just changes everything. The Greek word translated stir up in this sentence literally means to provoke somebody. Meaning it can actually be used and it is often used in a negative sense. Like to provoke an enemy, to cut or to jab at them, to to provoke them into a fight. That's the word that's used here. And I love that word because it's so strong. What it means is you should pester each other into faithfulness. That's awesome. Like that's, do you realize how not casual that is? We're so casual about our encouragement to each other, but it says pester each other into faithfulness. Provoke one another to love and good works. Incite good. In one another. But notice what it doesn't say, because what it doesn't say is just as important as what it does say. It doesn't say, pastors, provoke your congregations to love and good works. That is not what it says. That's what some of you have been hearing, but that's not what it says. It doesn't say that. What does it say? It says, let us, all of us, provoke one another to love and good works. We have to get rid of the consumer mentality. Not only is it killing the church, not only is it harming the church, but on the flip side, if we can get rid of that consumer mentality and say, even if I'm not serving, even if I don't have a position, every single time I gather with other believers, I have a role to play in their lives. If every single time we got together, we said, I am a corner man in your life, and I want you to do well, and I want to help you to do well, the church would be transformed in no time. Transformed into something the world hasn't seen in 2,000 years since the early church gave the example for what that looks like. We need to make it our mission to stir up others to love, to loving God, to loving people, and to good works. Serving, giving, helping, sharing, celebrating, mourning, whatever it is that they need. This is our job. Consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. The second part of that sentence says this. Not, so this is what we're called to do, stir up one another, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. We live in a time right now, in this moment, where it is culturally acceptable, both outside the church and even from Christians, to say, or it, it's culturally acceptable for Christians to treat the church as an optional element of their faith. You tracking with me? In other words, this is what you'll hear. This is usually how it's phrased. I don't need church to have a relationship with God. That's usually the way it's phrased. And there's an element of truth to that, but that's kind of the the thing that Satan does is he takes elements of truth and he twists them in order to deceive us. And here's what I mean by that. If you came to me and you said, hey, Pastor Jeff, I really like hanging out with you, but I don't like hanging out with you when your wife's around. I would say, cool, it was nice knowing you. Have a nice life. But listen, this is what people who think those things and say those things, they're saying the same thing to Jesus. I don't need to go to church in order to have a relationship with God. True, but how do you think Jesus is going to feel when you reject his bride? Do you think saying to him, hey, I want nothing to do with your bride, she's kind of messed up. And listen, she is. All right, look at you. Right, Look in the mirror. 
all right? She is messed up. She don't have her makeup all in the right, you know, whatever, okay? My point is, like, I don't think that Jesus takes kindly to people saying, I want to hang out with you but not your bride. And, and I'll prove this to you, but I just wanted to say that outright at first. First of all, let's look at the example of the early church. By the way, for those of you that sort of like glorify the early church, you need to know that the early church was jacked up. There was like this moment where everything was good and pure, and then it was all broken. In fact, one of the reasons we have most of the New Testament is because Paul or Peter or whoever is writing to either encourage believers to stay on their walk or telling them to knock it off for stupid things they were doing, right? So don't, don't glorify the early church as if it was something that was, uh, you know, divine completely or something like that, or perfect, I should say, right? Uh, but nevertheless, there is this window right after the church started. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. Uh, the church has just begun. Peter's preached the, the gospel in Jerusalem. Thousands of people have come to Jesus, but they haven't yet been persecuted. They haven't been scattered yet. There's this window between those two things, and this is where we see kind of the most pure vision of what the church could be and the consequences of what it could be. It's Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. And I'm going to go through and explain this as we go because there's things I want you to see. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Pause. Why the apostles' teaching? Well, because the apostles were the ones that were eyewitnesses of Jesus. They heard his teachings. They listened to him preach. And Jesus trusted them. And so people were like, well, we can't trust the words of man. Cool. Jesus trusted them. So you cannot trust them, but if Jesus trusted them with his word, maybe we should trust them too. And so they did. So when we're reading the words of scripture, essentially what we're doing is we are uh, reading, gosh, my voice today is, is yeah. You, you do this to me. It's your fault, all right? <clears throat> is this my, oh, gosh, this is bad. All right. <clears throat> The apostles' teaching. So we're still hearing it today. When we read the words of Scripture, we're still, we're still aligning ourselves with their teaching. He says, also to fellowship. We'll get into that in a second. But the fellowship looks like this, breaking of bread, which could just mean having meals together, or it could mean communion, right? The Lord's Supper. Of breaking of bread and to prayer. They prayed together. It says, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. God performed these wonders and signs through them. Why? To confirm to those that were around that the message was true. It added weight to their message. It says all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Let's pause there for a second. Our idea of giving in the modern church and in the United States in general is that we take a little bit of whatever we have left in the bank account and we'll give it away. The New Testament idea of giving is sacrificial giving for the good of others. And what they did is they didn't just say, I've got some coins left over, here have some coins left over. They sold their stuff so that other people who were in need could have stuff. If you've never done this before as a Christian, I want to encourage you to do this. Like, it's not really that radical. Go on Facebook Marketplace and say, I have a ton of stuff in my house. I'm going to sell this painting for $15, and I'm going to take that $15, and I'm going to give it to somebody in need. I encourage you to do it. That was uh, the norm in the early church. That is something that we need to bring back. I think, in the church today. One of you approves, I'm glad. All right. <clears throat> they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Oh, wait, I skipped a line, important line. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. So pause there. They met all together in the temple and then what did they do? They broke out into small groups. The early church had connect groups. Oh my gosh, my voice. <clears throat> I'm just going to have to be, I'm going to, you're going to have to listen to a whisper, that's all. 
But do you see that? Do you see that in there? I mean, it's describing the way that the early church operated. And, and what did they do? They all gathered together for worship, probably for teaching and things like that in the temple. And then they went into small groups and met with each other in people's homes. They did it with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I want to show you real quick. The first three things that are listed there, or, or the first three things I'll list here, are things that I think are pretty common for us in the church. Uh, they were devoted to teaching. You came here today knowing that you were going to hear teaching. They were devoted to, um, they were devoted to giving. They were devoted to prayer. These are all things that we typically think of when we think of church. But also notice that they were devoted, devoted to fellowship, to gathering with each other. They were devoted to sharing with one another. Again, these are things that they can happen on Sunday morning, and they do happen on Sunday morning. But the opportunities are greater in a smaller group. The opportunities are greater when you have an actual relationship with the people that you go to church with. And look at the result. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I do not think that's a coincidence. Give it up for my beautiful wife, everybody. Thank you. She gives me this, thinking it's going to help my throat, and really I'm going to choke and die, and then the sermon's really over. 50-50. All right, those are good odds. The result of that devotion was God honored that devotion and was saving people daily. That is not a complicated church. That is not a church with all the bells and whistles. That is the people of God gathering together together to worship and serve God as only the people of God can. I want to tackle some modern arguments. Maybe some of you have used them before. If this is your first time in church in a while and you've been a Christian for a long time, it's good timing. There's modern arguments against being devoted to the church, to the fellowship of believers. Here's the first one. I already mentioned it. I can just read my Bible at my home. I can read my Bible at my home. The word of God does not treat the church as something that's optional. It treats it as something that's essential. It treats it as a necessity. The funny thing, this, I've always, this has always struck me as kind of ironic, um, but I saw it in an Instagram post this week. Somebody was writing about it. And uh, I'll just kind of summarize it. The gist of it is this. If you say that you can just stay home and read your Bible rather than going to church, what you're revealing is that you've never actually read your Bible. Because it's the same word that you say that you're reading that tells us we need to gather together with believers. And so what you are is you're just kidding yourself. And, and I want to be careful because I want to show some grace here. I want to be truthful, but I want to show grace. Some of, some of you, including maybe some people listening online, you have been deeply wounded by the church. I want the others of you to know that if you hang around long enough, you too will be deeply wounded by the church. But Jesus didn't give up on us. And he's not given us permission to give up on each other either. I can read my Bible at home. The next one is it's just a man-made institution. The church is just a man-made institution. That's just factually inaccurate. <laughs> Matthew 16, 17, we don't have it on the screen. Jesus, Peter has just declared that Jesus is the Messiah. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, this is Jesus talking, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The next one is, I don't get anything out of church. I've heard this one before. There's some merit to this one, but you have to be very careful. 
And here's the reason why. I've run into people before who have said this very thing, and yet they're making no effort to pursue God in their own life. In other words, they're coming here expecting somebody to open their mouth and force feed them truth to make them obey. They say they're not getting anything out of it, and in reality, they have no desire and are putting no effort into getting anything out of it. One of the things I've learned in my life, um, one of the things I think I've done well in my life is just being a student of everything. I want to be able to learn from anything and everyone, good experiences, bad experiences, fools, and the wise. I think that if you come with an attitude to learn and to grow and to get something out of it, you will. And if you've chosen not to, you just definitely won't. So the first thing is to not assume that the church is the problem. The second thing, and this is what we're talking about today, is understanding this is not the only reason why the church exists. It doesn't exist just to feed you. It exists so that you will feed and help and build up others. That's the point. <laughs> and so <clears throat> while I want every single person to, to, um, to benefit from, and you should benefit from, from being a part of the church. However, that is not the only reason it exists. Let me hit you with the truth. We're told to encourage one another in this verse, but there's many similar one another commands in the scripture. Let me list a few for you. This isn't even all of them. Serve one another. Greet one another. Don't be walking by people with your eyes down. Be devoted to one another. Bear with and forgive one another. How about this one? Don't complain against one another. People squirming in their seats. Be at peace with one another. Honor one another. Submit to one another. Bear one another's burdens. Be hospitable to one another. Encourage and build up one another. And then, of course, all of these fall under the banner of the, the great commandment of the list here, which is to love one another. Let me ask you a question. If you're never gathered with other believers, tell me how you plan to fulfill the one another commands of Scripture. The answer is obvious. You can't. The church exists, yes, to feed you, to equip you, to support you, to give you a place to worship, to have, hopefully, Lord willing, godly leadership over you, directing, holding you accountable. But you are being disobedient if you're not bringing yourself, your encouragement, your gifts to the table for the sake of your brothers and sisters in this room. Do not neglect the gathering of believers. We need them to provoke us. You need them to provoke you. This is our job, is to poke sticks at each other until we're looking like Jesus, all right? And the last one, and we're to do this all the more as you see the day drawing near. You notice, can we put that up again? <clears throat> notice anything weird? Look at the capitalization in that. Day is capitalized because it's not talking about any generic day. It's talking about a specific day, a day when Christ returns for his people, when the judge comes back, when the king comes back on his horse, not as a broken sacrifice, but as a ruling and reigning king ready to dole out justice. Essentially what this is saying is it saying, you know that Jesus has told you to stay ready for his return, but now I tell you to help others stay ready for his return as well. Do it all the more as the day approaches. Some of you may remember <clears throat> this story. I've, I've told it once or twice, I think, but it's been a while. A long time ago, I was leading the exchange, 
and I was, um, there were these two kids in the exchange who were wrestlers, and they wanted to learn how to uh, do some, like, boxing and stuff from me, and so we just, like, I said, all right, come over to my house after school, uh, you know, I'll teach you some stuff in my yard, and both of these kids went to Barberton High School at the time, uh, their names were Alan and Cody, some of you may remember them, Alan and Cody, and uh, neither one of them uh, had a car, neither one of them could drive, and so they had to walk from Barberton High School to my house, which is just on the uh, border of Barberton and Coventry, and uh, Alan had been to my house before, but Cody hadn't, so Alan knew exactly how long it was going to take, because it's a several mile walk to get to my house, so let's just put it together, Um, this kid doesn't know where he's going, And now he has to walk several miles before having a hardcore workout where I'm going to punch him in the face. So this is what happened, right? But I love this story. It just illustrates so much because Alan and Cody, they were walking to my house. And uh, after a little while, Cody, realizing he doesn't know how far it is, goes, hey, how much further? And Alan, without skipping a beat, just says, a little further. (laughs) And then like a little while later, they're walking and walking and walking. He says, hey, uh, Alan, how much further? Oh, just a little further. And he did this multiple times on their walk until finally after walking all the way out to the edge of town, uh, they got to my house and they told me that story. And I just, loved, I just loved hearing that because it illustrates so much about the Christian life to me. Like this idea that do I know when Jesus is returning? No. Do I know that today he's closer to returning than yesterday? Yeah. And so as we walk together on this path, essentially what I learned from that is is that as the day is drawing near, we need to be more willing to say, hey, just a little further. I know you're ready to quit. I know it feels like we're never going to get there. But you just need to trust in this promise we're going to get there. And it's going to be worth it. And it's going to be good. So come just a little further. Don't give up yet. There's so much good ahead. It's worth investing your life and giving all of your life to Jesus. These are the things we're called to do. Oh, gosh. All right. We're going to speed date this last section here because my voice is going to go any minute. The command here is not just to do these things, not just to encourage each other. It is for us to consider how we can do it. Let us consider how we can spur each other on to love and good works. Band, you guys can come up now. Um, and so I want to take a few minutes and give you some really practical advice on some things you can do. Because if we're not ready to apply this, it doesn't matter anything that we've talked about before. We don't want to just have it in theory. We want to know it in practice. How do we encourage each other? How do we provoke each other to love and good works? The first way is just by being present. God can't work through you in someone else's life if you don't show up. It's simple. I'm not saying be here every week. I'm not saying saying you shouldn't enjoy time with your family. You shouldn't go on vacation, anything like that. Like I've said before, I'm not going to be here every week. It wouldn't be wise for me to... uh, to tell you to do the same, or, or to tell you to be here every week. But what I do know is that, that, man, we can't fulfill those one another, so just show up. And so the question I have, I'm going to phrase it in a different way just to get you thinking. Have you made gathering with God's people a habit? He says, he says don't get in the habit of stopping meeting together. I'm going to flip it into a positive and say, have you made meeting with God's people a habit in your life? And by the way, if it's a habit, it's not just something you do when you feel like it. The definition of a habit is it's something that you do even when you don't feel like it. It's part of your routine. It's become normal. Now, just because it's normal doesn't mean it's not special, right? But it becomes part of your routine. Have you made gathering with God's people a habit? If you want to encourage one another, another thing that we need to do is we need to be warm toward each other. There's a million ways I could have said this. I could have said be kind to each other, say hi to each other, be considerate toward one another. But but here's the thing. Like for some reason, those things don't always click with us. And so I'm going to say be warm to each other. When people are around you, particularly believers, when you walk into the church, 
Are you raising the temperature in the room or is it getting colder because you're frigid and you don't want to have a relationship with anybody? Pride keeps us cold. Be humble. Set your ego aside at the front door. We'll we'll get a bucket and you can put it in there. Put your ego aside at the front door and walk in here and raise the temperature. Be friendly toward each other. Be affectionate. The scriptures say that we should have brotherly affection or sisterly affection toward each other. Don't be cold. My wife and I lost a dog a year and some change ago, and our other dog seemed kind of sad. And so we said, you know what our dog needs? A dog. And so we got him a dog. And you know what our dog thinks of that new dog? Here's what, our, here's what the dog, they, they don't fight, they don't fight. There's, they have little testy moments and stuff like that. But the old dog avoids the new dog. At best, tolerates the new dog. We thought they were going to be like brothers and they were going to play and run around the field together. No. Some of you treat other believers, even in this room, like that. Where you're like, Hey, we can be in the same room, but I'm just going to tolerate you. This isn't what we're called to. Be the awkwardly social person, even if that's uncomfortable for you. Some of you, I know, you're not real social people. I'm not saying you have to, like, walk into the room and kick down the door and be like, what up, everybody? Let's go. That's not your personality. Fine. That's not mine either. But the reality is, is you can raise the temperature by just going up to somebody, hey, hey, it's good to see you this morning. Look them in the eye, shake their hand. If they're a willing participant, give them a hug. Let's, let's be warm toward each other. Next one is by bearing one another's burdens. We already mentioned this, so I'm not gonna go crazy on it. Are you carrying something that you need to share with somebody else? Some of you are carrying things alone. God has not called you to carry things alone. You need to pull aside somebody. It doesn't have to be me. My preference is that it wouldn't be me. Grab somebody that you trust in this room. Just say, hey, can I, can I share something with you for a second? Would you pray for me about this? Or do you know who could help about this? Just ask them. Is someone else carrying something that God is prompting you to help them with? Maybe somebody shared that with you this morning and you're like, cool, brother, let's go to service. Offer them help. Invite each other along. If you want to encourage somebody, invite each other along as you're doing life and ministry. A good example of this would be an older man or woman in this room, inviting a younger man or woman to come along as you do ministry, inviting them off out to coffee, sharing your life with them. Why? Because love and good works are contagious. They're contagious. They're like this wonderful disease that spreads when you get around them. I love being surrounded by people who are, who give me something to aspire to. When you see their faith, when you see their love, when they're passionate about evangelism, when they're seeking after God, it makes me want to be better. Some of those people for me are in this room. I'm, I'm your pastor, but that's just my job. Your job is to encourage everybody, including myself, and I get a lot of encouragement from people in this room, and I'm grateful for that. Take somebody along. And then lastly, for today, there's many other ways. Lastly, is by reminding each other of the truths of the gospel. If you lose sight of the fact that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, who came to this earth, who lived a human life but perfectly, who suffered and died for your sins and rose from death in order to save you, if you lose sight of that, you'll never be able to grow in your faithfulness. And so what we as believers need to do, we need to remind each other of that truth. And I'll give you like a more practical explanation of what you can do in order to do that. So like what you're not going to do probably is come into your connect group, come into church uh, and just say, um, hey, I just wanted to remind you that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, lived a perfect life, died, <laughs> died as a substitute. For, like you're not going to just list those things. Usually what would happen is something like this. 
uh, somebody comes to you and they say, hey, uh, I want to talk. I'm feeling depressed because I'm just feeling kind of worthless. I've got my past on my mind, and I know, like, like you say, that Jesus has forgiven me and stuff, but I just can't get past it. That's when you come to them and you say, listen, when Jesus died for you, his sacrifice was so perfect and so potent that to God and God's eyes, your sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. And if God looks at your sin that way, man, I want you to know you can look at your sin that way. Imagine that if we talked about our problems like that with each other and saying, instead of like, oh, that sucks, bro. Hope you figured it out. Come on, church, we can do better. We can do better. It's not complicated. We just have to do it. Read this story this week about this, this woman who went to the post office and she would go to this post office regularly because they had friendly people behind the counter and she would go to get stamps and this one winter she went to get stamps and it was right before Christmas and she got there and she gets into line and it's this huge long line because everybody's trying to get their packages out and stuff and she's standing in line and I believe I'm assuming based on the story that it was somebody in line who said hey you know they have a machine over there where you can just go put in some money and your stamps will pop out and you don't have to wait in line and she goes, oh, that's okay. A machine doesn't ask me about my arthritis. You tracking with me? There's something we can only get from each other. And there's something you have to offer to someone that they can't get from anybody but you. Let's take our job seriously. Call to action is really simple today. If you're a Christian here, I want you to provoke one another. I want you to jab and poke and pry and pester each other with love until you're all walking in faithfulness together. If you're not a Christian here today, I want you to know this very simply. No one is saved and no one sees God apart from faith in Jesus Christ. He came for you, he lived a perfect life, he died for you, and he rose for you. Your, your response today is first and foremost, to trust Jesus today, right now, in this moment. And you will be saved. That's what the scriptures teach. Because salvation is a gift. Why don't you stand? We're going to pray. We're going to worship. And then we'll get ready to go and have snacks and talk connect groups. If you could bow your head and close your eyes this morning, I want to first just invite those of you that would say, you know what? God, I want you to use me in this way. I want to be the kind of person who encourages people. I want to be the kind of person who provokes people to love and good works. And I want to invite your help. If that's you this morning, would you put your hand up in the air? I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. Now, keep those up. I also want to give an opportunity this morning. If you're here this morning, I want to pray for you as well. If you are a person who says, you know what? I've been living in sin. I've been doing things my own way, and I'm ready to trust Jesus with my life right now. I recognize that I need a Savior. I recognize that He is the Savior, and I believe in Him. Please pray for me. If that's you too, would you also put your hand up, or put a second hand up, I guess, if you already got it up. <laughs> All right, family, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much just for this morning, for this reminder that you've given us each other. God, we're so grateful that we can talk to you anytime, but we're also so grateful that you've given us each other so that we can encourage each other and strengthen each other, God, because we need each other. And I pray that we would just be better for each other. I pray that when people see us, that we would meet them with warmth. I pray that we would develop a, a godly habit of gathering with other believers and, and making sure that we're not just present, we're not just here, we're not just taking attendance, but rather that we're like living with purpose when we're together. Recognizing that, that even if we don't have a title or even if we're not scheduled to serve somewhere, we have a purpose for being here that's greater than just us. We're called to build each other up. And I just pray, especially for those that raised their hands first this morning, I just pray that you would encourage us and propel us in that direction. Help us to live that out by example. And that as a result, God, you would transform the culture of Movement Church into ones where people are freaked out by how we love each other in a good way. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody here this morning that responded and said, 
I need Jesus in my life. I pray that you would encourage their hearts. I pray that you would fill them with faith and help them to begin take steps, begin to take steps of faith forward. If anybody said, I'm not ready, I kind of want that, but I'm not ready, I pray that you would encourage their hearts as well and move them in the right direction. God, because we know you're the hope of the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship. Sing, I see you move. You move the mountains. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe I'll see you. Again, I've seen you move, you move the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. I see you 
things. Uh, don't forget to give if you need to back at the cafe. Stop by Connect Central to sign yourself up for Sunday Serve Day and to get more information about other things. And then meet us downstairs for some snacks and uh, opportunity to talk connect groups. You can figure out which group is best suited for you. Uh, love you guys. Have a great week. See you downstairs. Thanks.